Hi, this is Peter Connection with Oxford College, and I'm really delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Frank Stecci. He's a general practitioner in Hamilton and also uh, works with the Hamilton Academy of Dentistry. Um, you've been speaking, uh, coming to Oxford College uh, for several years and being uh, traveling uh, to other kind of dental hygiene uh, colleges and universities throughout Canada to talk about the issue of uh, uh, physical and sexual abuse and how dental hygienists can uh, kind of see and deal with these kind of situations. Um, can you just tell us more about what you do? Sure. Um, basically, I'm a general practitioner and been involved in forensics for the better part of about 30, maybe 34 years, somewhere in that area. Um, what I do with the students here at Oxford is to the point of uh, being able to have them understand that they have the unique knowledge base of dentistry. And a lot of times we take that for granted. Um, dentistry has so much to present to the healthcare profession and of all the healthcare professionals in basically in North America as far as that goes, uh, dentistry itself is in a unique situation where the patients want to come back on a regular basis, whether it's every three to four months, every six months, every nine months or whatever, but routinely they come back, which allows us a couple of things. As healthcare professionals, dentists, hygienists, assistants and so forth, we can update their our regular medical status itself, but also dental status. Uh, if we need to get x-rays, we can get x-rays done, photographs done, and this is very objective evidence. In other words, uh, when you've got something, um, an x-ray, no question, that's, that is the tooth. Uh, it can't be interpreted any other which way. If it has uh, an occlusal amalgam, for example, as compared to a resin, we can see that on the x-ray. And uh, so with that, I want them to realize that if they say, for example, uh, we're dealing with tooth number 1-6 and we've got uh, an MO amalgam and an occlusal lingual resin, the tooth has been treated endonically with gutta percha in three canals, however, on the medial buccal, uh, it's a divergent canal split from the two. Uh, you know, basically the dental professional will know what we're talking about. Try to do that with somebody, a uh, regular individual, unbeknownst with the dental knowledge, unique dental knowledge of dentistry, they won't know what you're talking about. We'd have to say we're dealing with the first permanent molar in the upper right hand side. Mm -hmm. The tooth has five surfaces to it. We have the front and the back, the mesial and distal. We have the cheek side, the tongue side, buccal and lingual. We have the occlusal surface. So every tooth has five surfaces. If we look at the human dentition, adult, we have 32 teeth. Multiply 32 by five, we have 160 different surfaces that potentially could have an area decay on them, could have a filling on them. There's 16 different restorative procedures that we could use in the Western world to fill this specific area on the tooth itself. Start putting all this together with root canals and rotations on the teeth and so forth. We have a variety of different bits of information on a computer aspect and the computer lingo. Computer-wise, we have literally almost a trillion hits, dentally speaking, that we have, that we collect every day. Whether a hygienist, a dentist, assistant, as we do our dental records, we have, we're doing forensic dentistry each and every day whether we realize it or not. That information, however, can be taken now on a victim of a crime or an accident, we do the same type of an x-ray, a PA, a bite wing, and so forth, on the remains of that uh, victim, and compare them now with the anti-mortem records, anti-mortem before death, with the post-mortem, post meaning after death, and compare those two, so we can do a positive identification all the way through as necessary. The other aspect is with the dentition, a bite, is, uh, a bite mark is like a pattern injury, it's like a fingerprint, it's unique to that individual dentition, and we can sometimes screen out from the population base, is this person worthy of consideration in a crime if there's a bite mark as compared to somebody else, yes or no. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that they did a specific crime, it's just now you're narrowing the uh, investigative base down to some specific people. What I would like to be able to do to the uh, students is say, recognize that you have that unique knowledge base of dentistry. And once you have that, now, be able to recognize key signs of abuse. It doesn't matter. It could be a child, it could be a, an adult. Uh, my youngest victim was seven days of age, the oldest was 97 years of age, and you got everything in between. So with that, you know, once you get suspicious, something in here, especially with child abuse, a child being 16 years of age and under, you're suspicious. You recognize there's a problem, you report it. And I, I mentioned the students, it's like phoning 911. You don't have to be a firefighter, but if you're walking down the street and see smoke coming out of a window, and uh, recognize number one, there's an emergency, you've got a fire, all right? 
what do you do? You report it by cell phone, 911, or somehow get the fire department down there. We're not asking them to take the hose and go in there and fight the fire. There's professionals that do that. The same thing here. They recognize that there might be a problem. This bruise pattern doesn't is not consistent with what they're telling, what the person's telling you. Fine, report it. Let the professionals come in. Be it the Children's Aid Society, be it the police department. They're the professionals that come in there. But they are unique to the point that they will trigger the system to act. They, now, you've been, again, you've been teaching this to our students for several years now. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, as they go around the country, um, why, do you, is, why is it important for you to kind of let our students and dental hygienists know about the, their abilities to actually catch and, and check and be able to deal with kind of uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, and learn these things? Why do you think it's important? It's important because it's happening each and every day. They're seeing patients in, their, in the clinic environment or in their private office environment. Uh, study after study after study that I've done with my own patients, 41% are victims of abuse. Child abuse, domestic or family violence, spousal or partner abuse. And we ask that on our medical history form. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to investigate that uh, crime, because it is a crime. But at the same time, I'm a mandated reporter. As a healthcare professional, as are the hygienists, when they graduate and they get that piece of paper from Oxford College, they are now a mandated reporter. They must, by law, report their suspicion. That's all we're asking for, suspicion of abuse to the proper authorities, be it the Children's Aid Society, the police department. Somebody has to activate the system, and that's all they have to do. If not according to the law in Ontario, and throughout North America, they will be penalized by their respective colleges with a license suspension and or a fine, as would I. But Oxford is unique. Niagara College is another one that I you know, do presentations to. Those students will graduate knowing their responsibilities. A lot of other colleges don't have that. Why? Because that never entered their mind. As the staff that are teaching the courses to the students did not have that when they were students, and if they didn't have that, they'll teach again what they know. But this is happening all the time. It was never brought for them. All right. When I graduated, or when I was uh, with the faculty of dentistry, well, we never had a course like this. I learned all my stuff when I took various courses in uh, in the states and so forth. A lot of it is in the states where you get the proper training. But there's so much more to forensic dentistry. Uh, a car accident, the body is burnt beyond recognition. You read in the paper. We'll say they have to be identified through dental records. And that's, again, comparing anti-mortem x-rays, the x-rays that we have in our clinics right now, mm -hmm. comparing to x-rays we take on the remains. And that's the closest most people get to forensic dentistry. But you've got uh, mass disaster response. How do you respond to the World Trade Center? Mm -hmm. You had 256 dentists that responded there. A lot of the IDs had to be done through dental records. Sure, DNA is available, but it takes a minimum of three weeks to get that. You need three blood samples. You need one from the victim and two from the blood relative. Who's the blood relative? Right. Right. There's a lot more complexity to it, and it doesn't happen in five minutes like it does on, you know, CSI yeah. and CIS. Yeah. And the cost factor. All right. Uh, I remember one case I had back about five, six years ago. It was almost seventeen hundred dollars Canadian to get a DNA analysis done. Well, you know, budgets are restrictive. Right. Right. So, but if they can look at it in the same way that I'm not asking, you know, even the hygienist students to be firefighters, but if they see a house is on fire, they report it. Let the professionals come in and do their job. And that's all we're asking them to do. At the same time, showing them that uh, not to be afraid because they see a bruise. And you don't get, they don't get a right answer from the, the child or from the adult, well, more of the children. Um, that's not to say that they don't report it. They can report it. The law says they must report it. Now, let's say it's some medical condition that they weren't aware of. There is no liability. In other words, nobody can sue the hygiene. Uh, hygienist yeah. because the report was made. As long as there is no malice in that reporting, that person is protected. The law says as much as we say you must report, we will also protect you as long as there is no malice. Do, yes. Okay, if that wasn't the case itself. The, uh, one final question is uh, if people are uh, like educators and other people are more interested in, in the work you're doing as this kind of area, what, what kind of resources could you point them to? Uh, with your staff, I've given a handout. It has a textbook, it has websites on it, it has various courses that are available for everything from uh, inter introductory courses to hands-on, right in the morgue and so on, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with uh, identification processes and so forth. Um, 
it's like everything else. There's a first step is an introductory course. You know, if you go dentistry, forensic dentistry 101, mm -hmm. then when you take that one, then you go to forensic dentistry 201, and then 301, mm -hmm. and so forth. Every one is a stepping stone to something else. Uh, for some of your students here, for example, if there was a mass disaster in the greater Toronto area, and we had victims that had to be, had to be identified through dental records, I would venture to say that, yes, uh, for those who would want to and so forth, they already have that unique knowledge base of dentistry. They know what uh, difference is between an upper and a lower central incisor and the difference between the right and left hand side. So they have a unique knowledge base of dentistry. A little bit of training and so forth, if we had something like the Trade Center disaster, which is going to last more than just a day to do the identifications, mm -hmm. no question. They can be brought in, trained and so forth, under the supervision of somebody else and so on. But if we needed the, uh, the people power, the manpower, if you will, to be able to work as a team, we don't have those resources, which I venture to say in the province of Ontario, we don't have those at all. Had we had something like 9-11. Uh, there's no way that we'd have the resources. We'd have to call in the states and have people come in. Um, so, you know, but the training is easily done because they already have the foundation of dentistry. And then, you know, I feel, you know, maybe students don't feel, but uh, at Oxford, yeah, in my opinion, they're privileged to have the staff look far enough in advance to say, I think we should have somebody come in and teach even the basic uh, response to uh, forensic dentistry, abuse recognition, I did mention mass disaster response, and there's some programs that are available for that. All right. uh, just something as simple as being able to keep proper and thorough dental records. There are records that they're keeping clinically. All right. It's as much possible that we could use those x-rays and clinical notes and so on to do an identification should their patient become a victim of a crime or an accident. But at the same time, personally, as a healthcare professional, you're also doing yourself a favor because you've got enough notes there that if somebody says, well, you didn't do that for me, uh, and yet you've got indications that you know, the patient was told they must floss and so on, they're not flossing, and mm -hmm. that they build up a charter and we show them that they made clinical notes on that. And then they go to another uh, dentist or another hygiene uh, office, and they say, well, heck, I've been going for two years, three years there, and uh, that's the first time they ever told me that. They say, no, hold it, I've got a list here. And I've got, we've got x-rays, we've got clinical notes, we did the perio charting, the full mouth, buckle, lingual, mm -hmm. anything else. You've got the notes. That's your protection from liability from that patient. Because patients, they're getting more litigious now that they're going to sue for almost anything. But if you've got your notes, you're protecting yourself as well as the patient. Well, thank you again for coming hey, and speaking you're with us. You're and uh, and we, we look forward to seeing you again. No problem. My pleasure. Take care.